Hello, I'm Larry Wilson, and welcome to our December 2003 broadcast. Last month, we investigated several parallels between the fourth beast of Daniel 7 and the composite beast of Revelation 13. There are certain interesting parallels and certain interesting distinctions between these two beasts. So let's review for a moment nine parallels presented last month. And I want to go over these carefully because it's important that you see the parallel as well as the distinction that keeps them separate. They are not the same beast. The fourth beast of Daniel uh, 7 represented the Roman Empire, that fourth empire that ruled over the world between 168 B.C. and A.D. 476. The composite beast in Revelation 13 represents a crisis government that will rise up and rule over all nations for 42 months during the Great Tribulation. The ancient beast of Daniel 7, the fourth beast, is in the past. The composite beast in Revelation 13 is in the future. Let's go to the computer screen and notice some of these parallels. Point number two. The monster beast in Daniel 7 had ten horns. And you recall how that uh, the little horn, as it came up, plucked up three of the ten. But the crisis government in Revelation 13, or the composite beast, not only has ten horns, it has seven heads as well. A total of 17 parts. 17 parts. This is a critical point. After Rome fell to the ten horns in A.D. 476, the little horn power uprooted the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, and the Hurrieli. The Roman Catholic Church, the little horn power of Daniel 7, dominated the seven remaining kingdoms, the seven remaining horns of Europe for 1260 years. And uh, in fact, the dominion of the Roman Catholic Church became known as the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the seven heads of the crisis government that is going to appear represent the seven religious systems of the world. You know, some people say that the composite beast in Revelation 13 is the Roman Catholic Church. That's not possible. Not at all. The Roman Catholic Church is not going to govern or rule over the other six religious systems of the world. It's not possible. We have several, several miserable centuries in ancient history called the Crusades when the forces of religion faced each other and one could not dominate the other. The seven religious systems of the world are represented as the seven heads of the composite beast. I'll show you that in just a moment. We'll review that. And when the devil physically appears, he belongs, he will belong to the seven heads, but he will be the eighth king. He will rule over the seven heads. And the parallel here is that the devil will dominate the seven heads during the Great Tribulation, just as the papacy dominated the seven horns of Europe during the Dark Ages. Now, I want to take a few moments. I know that last month we went over this, but I, this is so critical that I want to do it again. I want to review the specifications of the seven heads with you. We know, according to Revelation 13, on each head there was a blasphemous name. The word blasphemous means defiant toward God, who is, of course, the higher authority. To blaspheme is to be defiant or to usurp the authority of God. 
Now the horns are not, don't have blasphemous names on them, only the heads, which indicate that they have religious significance. They are defiant toward God. One head had been wounded, but the deadly wound had been healed when the composite beast comes up out of the sea. The Roman Catholic Church was wounded in 1798, and the healing will be completed when the Great Tribulation begins. You remember this chart we looked at last uh, month, how that the, the Little Horn power fell in 1798, and since that time, the Little Horn has been healing. And so one of the heads, one of the seven heads, in fact, the sixth head is the Roman Catholic Church. And when the composite beast, which is the crisis government, rises, the Bible says the deadly wound had been healed. Obviously, this has to be after the deadly wound is inflicted. So we're talking or chronological order. Here we are today, and here, and here is the upcoming judgments of God and the rise of of the demonic dominion by the composite beast. And the composite beast will rule the world for a period of 1260 days or 42 months, will persecute the saints while trying to appease God. And then the eighth king, the devil, the lamb-like beast, you, got, you see I've drawn him, drawn him like a, a lamb, but you can see he's got a dragon tail and you can see his... his uh, red feet sticking out there. Lucifer is the Antichrist, the lamb-like beast who will masquerade as God. And um, we, we're going we're gonna to now examine these seven heads a little more carefully to see how they make up the seven religions of the world. Let's go back to the computer and notice what the Bible says. In Revelation 17, Verse uh, 10, the Bible says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. King James Version here. The seven heads are seven mountains or seven hills, if you will. I'd like to show you how that a mountain represents a religious system. Look at Micah 4.1. In the last days... The mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. What does this language mean to you? Well, if you're acquainted with the way the ancient people used language, you would understand the, the imagery that this refers to. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple now, where is the Lord's temple in Micah's time located? It was located on the top of Mount Moriah, Mount Zion, as it's sometimes called as well. So in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and peoples will stream to it. This prophecy in Micah 4 would have occurred under plan A, had Israel been faithful, and the superiority of Israel's God would have been proven in the last days under of plan A. So the mountain of the Lord's temple would be established as chief among all other rivals. That's the meaning of this type of language. It's beautiful. And you have to read some of the Old Testament to sort of get into the flow of how language is used. Beautiful language. Let's go to 1 Kings 14.22. The Bible says Judah did evil. The nation of Judah, you know, as the two southern tribes, did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than their fathers had done. They also set up for themselves high places, high places, that's a clue, sacred stones and Asherah poles, Asherah poles were uh, symbols, 
sort of like totem poles, if you will. Asherah poles, totem poles, the, the, the alignment, the arrangement of, the, of gods and the spirits. So Judah set up for themselves high places, that means in the mountains, sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. Ezekiel 6, 13. And they will know that I am the Lord when their people lie slain among their idols, around their altars, on every high hill, and on all the mountaintops. Why did the ancients go on top of the mountains to worship? Why did they put their idols and burn fragrant incense to them under every spreading tree and every leafy oak in these high places on top of the mountains? I'll show you something in just a second. Jeremiah 17, 1, God said to Jeremiah, Judah's sin is engraved with an iron tool, can't be washed out, inscribed with a flint point on, tab on the tablets of their hearts and on the horns of their altars. Even their children remember their altars and Asherah poles beside the spreading trees and on the high hills. My mountain in the land and your wealth and all your treasures I will give away as plunder together with your high places because of sin throughout your country. What does the Lord mean, my mountain in your land? He's talking about his temple mount, his dwelling place. Ezekiel 20, 40, the Lord told Ezekiel, For on my holy mountain, the high mountain of Israel, declares the sovereign Lord, there in the land the entire house of Israel will serve me, and there I will accept them. There I will require your offerings and your choice gifts along with all your holy sacrifices. Under plan A, this is what would have happened at the temple on Mount Moriah. But Israel refused. Israel failed. And their house on God's holy mountain was left to them empty. Now, I want to show you something. Take a look at this. We're going to, I want to, I want to show you a National Geographic magazine. And uh, let's take a look at the March 1992 National Geographic. And we'll zoom out a little bit so you can recognize the, the cover here. It has a beautiful ape on it. <laughs> I want to turn to the article on page um, 84 called Sacred Peaks of the Andes. And I'm going to zoom in so that you can see the writing, what is written here in National Geographic, March 1992. The article by Johann Reinhard called Sacred Peaks of the Andes, and this is what he says. In the path of his ancestors, a pilgrim braves the 16,000-foot slopes of a mountain that I can't pronounce near Cusco, Peru, to honor ancient deities that still reign over daily life. Since before the time of the Inca, Andeans have worshipped the mountains themselves as gods. Now, this is an archaeological trip to the Andes to examine some of the ancient worship sites on the sacred peaks of the Andes. And this article is very interesting, and it has some ama amazing photographs. And some of the pictures here on what was necessary to, to get the building materials for a temple, for a place to worship on the top of these mountains. And the efforts these people went to is truly amazing. I hope that you will go to your library and uh, examine this article. It's really a, a, a recent commentary, if you will, on what is commonly understood throughout the Old Testament. The picture that I want you to look at um, is here. Let me get my camera uh, appropriately set for you. Can you see the thousands and thousands of people that are here way above the tree line, and they've come here to worship on the mountain. 
And I'm going to zoom in so that you can see that at the heart of this worship is, is a temple. This way up in the top of the mountains of the Andes. It's quite a, quite a scene to, uh, to understand. This is what God is talking about in the Old Testament, how that Israel went up on the mountains, went up and, and, and there they, they worshipped these false gods. They burned incense to these false gods. And this is what the scripture means. For on my holy mountain, the high mountain of Israel, declares the Lord, the sovereign Lord, there the land, the entire house of Israel will serve me, and there I will accept them. And this is, a, you know, compared to their worship on other mountains. The point of all of this is that a mountain, these seven heads are seven mountains. They are seven deities, seven religious systems. Look at Daniel 9.16. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, comma, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. You see the point here? Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, was also called thy holy mountain. I suppose that the idea of God dwelling on a mountain may have uh, started in Israel at Mount Sinai when he came down and with great flames delivered the law to Israel. We find that uh, the prophets of Baal met Elijah on Mount Carmel, built an altar on top of the mountain. Why on top of the mountain? What's the thing and what's the deal with the mountain? Well, the, the mountains were considered the footstools of the gods. The reason the seven heads are referred to as seven mountains is not a insignificant detail. It is a very rich and expressive way of making a statement that would remain obscure until the time for understanding should come. And that's what has happened. The seven mountains are seven different gods, religious systems, or belief systems about God, or gods. So, let's go back to the computer screen. So, we know this. The Bible says the seven heads each have a blasphemous name written on them. We know that one had been healed when the composite beast comes up out of the sea. We know also that they are seven mountains. And Revelation 17.10 says they are also seven kings. That is, each religious system has subjects. Now let's talk about this for just a second. When you belong to a religious organization, you are subject to the authority of that organization. Try this. Let's just prove it. Ask your priest, rabbi, or pastor if you can play this video for the midweek service. <laughs> if he refuses, go over his head. Go to the board of elders and ask them. And if they refuse, go to the highest authority in your church to ask them. See, the reason you're having to go to higher authorities is because you're subject to their authority to get permission. If you are refused and you attempt to show this video at your midweek service, you will be punished in some way because members of all religious systems are subject to the authority of their religious system. As long as you are obedient and compliant, no problem. You can be a member for years and have no problems, but once you openly resist or defy or blaspheme the authority of your religious system, 
You're toast. You're cooked. <laughs> you can't underestimate religious authority. Americans have a difficult problem with religious authority because we've not had to live under it. But if you've lived in another country where the government was controlled by religions, uh, religious views, uh, you would well understand the authority of a religious system. We live in a, fortunately, a nation that is trying its best to be neutral about God, and that's causing quite a stir, even as I'm taping uh, this broadcast today. You see, religious systems are kings. That's why they're called kings, is because they have authority, they have subjects. And in 95 AD, when John had this vision, the angel Gabriel said to him, John, five of these heads, five of these religious systems have fallen. Now, this is a critical point, too. Some people today say that the seven heads represent the seven popes that will occupy Vatican City after the restoration of the Lateran Treaty in 1929. You know, Mussolini returned Vatican City to the papacy in 1929. And some people try to make these seven heads to represent seven popes. And the idea is that the current pope, John Paul II, is very frail, and he's the sixth pope. And when he dies, the seventh pope will come along, and he will remain for a little while. Well, there's a problem with this view. The problem is, when the angel is talking to John, the year is, five, is, is A.D. 95. In other words, five of these heads have been exposed as false or fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. In 95 A.D., five religious systems had been proven false. Heathenism is where man makes up what he wants God to be. Heathenism is where man creates God. A lot of heathen in this world today. Atheism is a religious system that says there is no God. In other words, it's a religious belief denying the existence of God, and it does everything it can to prove that God does not exist. It has its own set of doctrines and beliefs, just like heathenism. Now, Islam. The Islam began with Ishmael. In fact, the Islamic uh, people believe that Ishmael is the father of their faith. It's true that Mohammed, in the 6th century A.D., organized and brought together the, the writings we call, they call the, the Quran. But Ishmael is the father of Islam, not Mohammed. Mohammed is a prophet. And also from Abraham, we have Isaac and the beginning of Judaism. Of course, you know, Jacob is the offspring of Isaac and Jacob became the father of 12 sons that make up the 12 tribes of Israel. So we have a religious system, two religious systems coming out of Abraham. And then we have Eastern mysticism, which is a, an inclusive expression def defining a religious set, series or set of views that God is in the mystics. God is mystical. God Man can become like God. And the Eastern mysticism and Buddhism and Hinduism and all of these ancient Eastern mystic religions were proven false the day Jesus was born. Heathenism, atheism, Islam and Judaism and Eastern mysticism were all fallen 
At the time, John was on the Isle of Patmos. Now, the angel said, John, one is, and one is yet to come. And the last one, when it comes, it will only last a short time. Catholicism has been around for approximately 2,000 years. John was a charter member. The Apostle John was a charter member of Catholicism, of what we today call Catholicism. And Protestantism then came out of Catholicism. There are the seven religions of the world. And you can't think of any person on earth that doesn't belong in one of these seven religious systems. Seven heads have to, spec have to satisfy these five specifications. They have to have a blasphemous name. They have to be defiant toward God. One has to be healed after receiving a deadly wound. The deadly wound occurred in 1798. So, these can't be seven popes because no pope since living in 1798 is alive today. These have to be seven mountains. And we've already seen that the mountains represent not individuals, but gods. Seven kings, they have subjects. And in AD 95, when the angel talked to John, he says, five have fallen. One is and one is yet to come. But wait, there's more. Let's get this in before we take our intermission. The beast which you saw, John. Now this is the angel talking to John. The beast which you saw once was visible. I've inserted the word visible here. Now is not visible. Okay? Satan was once visible. John saw him cast out of heaven and with his angels. And he was cast into the earth. And at the present time, he is not visible. But he will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. And the inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, in other words, the wicked, the wicked will be what? Astonished when they see the beast. Why will they be astonished when they see the devil? physically appear? The Bible answers, because he once was visible, now is not visible, and yet will come up out of the abyss and be visible. This will startle the whole world. You say, you mean the devil was visible at one time? Yes, John saw it. Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, Call the devil and Satan. Who is the great dragon? Who does the Bible say the dragon is? The devil, Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out. And where was he cast out? Into the earth. That's right. He is inside the earth. <laughs> the Greek word into here is used for describing when you throw a rock into a pond of water. He was cast out of heaven and into a prison, a spiritual prison, if you, a physical prison. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And at the appointed time, guess what's going to happen? A lamb-like beast will come up out of the earth, and he has, will have two horns like the lamb, but he will speak like the dragon. Well, we're out of time for this segment. I'm trying to show you that the seven heads of Revelation 13 are seven religious systems, and I'm trying to carefully show you how the Bible language leaves no room for negotiation. There's no wiggle room. When you add up all the specifications, we're going to see that with the physical appearing of the devil, the lamb-like beast, ruling over the seven heads, consolidating the seven religious systems into one world religion, is what is coming and just before us. Well, we're out of time. May God bless you, and we'll see you in our next segment.